So, okay, so I just want to say welcome. Um, my name is Sarah. So Sarah Alden and I work at the Cooperative College as International Programs Manager. Hi, I'm Rebecca Harvey. I'm Executive Editor at Co-op News, which is a magazine about and for cooperatives. Um, and just to introduce this really, so it's a, it's a Cooperative College Centenary Year. Um, and towards the end of last year, we decided, you know, how can we use the college as an educational charity to discuss things that are really interesting. Um, and so we came up with a range of themes um, to explore of the year. And so one of the things I picked um, was around gender and cooperatives. Um, and how me and Bex know each other is one, we're on the same floor, mm -hmm. um, but also that we um, are both really passionate about exploring the role of, of women in the cooperative movement. You know, we've done um, worked a piece of research together um, with women in, in the UK in the movement. Mm -hmm. We've held um, forums, we've held an event. Um, so it's, this, is, this is a continuation of something that we're really interested in. Um, so Bex is going to give us a little bit of a background into the Cooperative Women's Challenge, mm -hmm. um, which is a backdrop to this whole um, series, really. Does anyone know what their Cooperative Women's Challenge is? If you, if you do, just give us a wave. Oh, thanks, great. At least one person does. So the Cooperative Women's Challenge was an initiative set up in about 2011. Um, it was group, It was led by the Cooperative Group in the UK, uh, but it was cross-sector. And it was founded to, to do three main things, really, to focus on fair representation and democratic structures, focus on more women in management, to get women into higher positions within cooperative retail societies and other organisations, and also focusing on wider campaigns for gender. So it's all about equality across economy and society. And the way we got involved was, was it about three years ago? Yes. The, the Women's Challenge was reignited. So Cooperatives UK, the Co-op College and Cooperative Press, which is the cooperative that publishes Co-op News, got together and said, right, okay, how can we can actually put the Cooperative Women's Challenge into action? What is the challenge for women in cooperative today, both in the UK and internationally? So on the back of that, we started doing events and this webinar, I guess, is an extension of that. Mm, yeah, yeah, it is. And just to, just to link me to Rachel as well, so when I used to work at Cooperative UK, um, I think we've lost John. We've lost John. We've lost Bill. John Bill. <laughs> well, John's, uh, yeah, yeah, we've lost Bill. Um, so, yeah, the link to um, Rachel is when I was at Cooperative UK, we, we, Cooperative UK was, was hosting the Women's Challenge. We, we had set up a website and Rachel was our guest um, speaker on, she, you were doing regular um, inputs for historical cooperative women and she used to put regular stories online for us. So, um, so that's it, there's, there's lots of connections here. So, um, and also just, I'm just conscious of the number of people here. So um, there may be more people coming in and if not, this is a perfectly formed group as well. Mm -hmm. So just, just bear with the numbers of people and she's bobbing in and out. Um, so the format of this is that we're going to be in conversation with Rachel for Burberry and also with Rebecca Morahan. Um, and they said they'd like to introduce themselves. So I'll let Rachel and Rebecca introduce themselves. Right. And to unmute. <laughs> Right. Well, I'm Rachel Vorberg Rue. I'm coming to you live from Texas in the US. Um, but I lived in uh, Manchester for several years and worked for the Cooperative College, uh, left about five years ago. Um, I was there on a research project that was looking at a history of the cooperative group in the UK and called Building Cooperation, which came out in 2013. Uh, I also helped edit a book called uh, Mainstreaming Cooperation, which drew on a whole lot of different um, uh, aspects of cooperation based on a conference that the college hosted in 2012, I think. Um, it's all coming back to me. Um, <laughs> I did a lot of research, particularly my focus has been on um, gender and the cooperative movement in the UK and historically in the period I tend to look at most is from about the 1880s to the 1920s, but I can go a bit farther back and a bit farther forward in time as well. Mm. Great, thank you. I'm Becca Morahan and um, I'm just kind of getting involved again with the college. I used to do some work as an associate about um, eight years ago and since then I've been working increasingly with a focus on gender and my experience for gosh almost 20 years, which makes me feel a bit old now, um, is working with uh, cooperatives that are 
bringing together agricultural producers in the global south. And so, yeah, since about 2012, I've been doing that with a focus on women's inclusion and sort of gender sensitive approaches to including women in co-ops. Mm. Brilliant. I think when, we, when myself and um, Becky were thinking about doing this webinar, we just thought, you know, the historical perspective for women in the movement and also this international perspective would be really nice. So just thank you, Rachel and Becky, for actually coming um, and, oh, yeah, and being part of this. My so pleasure. We're going we're gonna to go to um, Rachel Vorberg. We're going to go to Texas first. <laughs> uh, and so... Rachel, with just based on your background and experience, then what role did women play in cooperatives historically? Well, I think if you look at, um, and I'll talk mostly about the UK context uh, here, but in Britain, I think it's important to say at the outset that cooperatives were extremely important to women and women were extremely important to cooperatives from the get-go. So um, co-ops were from the, from their earliest inception in about the late 18th, early 19th century. So really coming to fruition starting the 1820s and 30s. And uh, mm -hmm. it's 1844, of course, that we get the Rochdale pioneers. But in this period, uh, there's a lot of discussion in radical movements um, uh, about women's equality. They're a big part mm -hmm. of talking about uh, Robert Owen and Owenite communities, which were uh, the original project of the Rochdale Pioneers, the store was intended to fund. Uh, Chartism, mm -hmm. which is talking about a variety of the aspects of political rights, there is definitely discussions about women's voting rights as part of Chartism, although uh, it wasn't mm -hmm. in the original charter. Um, so, but they're starting from this spot where uh, there is some idea about women's equality, um, which is, again, a very radical notion. Uh, so that created some space for women's involvement in cooperatives from the get-go, but also the way that cooperative stores and consumer cooperatives started in the UK um, were really based around food and household goods. And that meant that to a large degree, women were, uh, were involved in that project all from, almost from the get-go. Yeah. So when we think about the Rochdale pioneers as these 28 men, and we all know the famous photo of the, some yeah, of the pioneers, yeah it's all men well i like to say those men would have gotten nowhere had they not been able to attract women to their shops to buy the goods that kept mm -hmm. it economically viable um mm -hmm. so for women there's you know, so women that are interested that are looking at a cooperative in this point in time it, there's obviously some space for them there that wasn't there in the same way in other movements of the period trade unions tended to be gender segregated and very much focused on men for instance um, so there's a space for them, but there's also real practical application to the realities of their lives. And that's part of the way that uh, working people's families were set up and the family economy was set up. So all of the people that are working in the family bring their wages home, so husbands, children, and really it's in most families, it's the wives and mothers that are the domestic managers, the financial managers mm -hmm. of the family, and they're the ones that are making decisions about spending. And that's mm. important when most people are living on a pound a week or less. Uh, it's very much a weekly, week to week kind of existence. There is no social safety net. There is no NHS. There is no unemployment insurance. None of those things exist in the least. So how you spend that money and how you can try to save is super important. Mm. And the way that the dividend worked um, was a huge advantage to women. So they know that they're going to co-op shop, they can get unadulterated food and goods. That's an mm -hmm. important selling point. Uh, they're at, you know, intended to be at the same kinds of prices that uh, are going on in, in private shops. But then there's this dividend that accumulates. So depending on how much they spend in the shop, a little bit accrues. So at the end of six months or a year, they get this lump sum of the dividend payment that they can either reinvest in the stores and earn interest on and save as a nest egg, mm -hmm or they have this lump sum that they can pull on that could be uh, someone's been out of work and this is keeping us afloat. It could be, hey, we can buy the children's shoes. You know, and everyone's outgrown mm -hmm. all those shoes. We, can, we now have something we can, we can plan on to do that. So what I think is really interesting for women in particular is that it's connecting these things, these practical realities that it's mm -hmm. making a direct improvement in their lives but it's also connected to, and by doing this, we're also contributing to a fairer, better world mm -hmm. for ourselves. 
um, and that there is at least a nominal equipment, uh, uh, there is at least some idea of women's equality in the basic rules of co-ops. And we know that women were participating in, in even the earliest co-ops. So there was a co-op in Rippenden in, um, in Yorkshire that is already set up in 18, 1832. By 1834, they have 45 members and seven of them are women. Mm-hmm. So, we, you know, we can see at least some names. The Rochdale Pioneers, we know um, the name of the first woman member that we know of was Eliza Brierley. All we know about her was that she was a Miss Eliza Brierley, so she was unmarried. <laughs> uh, she was a weaver. Uh, she applied in March of 1846, and two weeks later, her application was acceptable, accepted, and literally that's all we know about her, but we know that she, she went through the same process as everyone else, and she was there. So even though there were a lot of cultural stigmas for women's participation in, in a business or in a public role in some way, and just even mm-hmm. attending a cooperative meeting was a public role for a long time, um, they were there. And they were mm. uh, they, they were able to be there under the rules. Mm. Twenty five years sounds quite a long time, though. So the Rochdale pioneers were well, forty four, and she was mm. in. When, when did she join? Sorry. When did Eliza join? In eighteen forty six. So two right, years. Okay. Oh, so not too bad. Okay. Right. Um, <laughs> and I think that she's she's the name that we know, uh, and the and kind of a rarity in that regard, but. There are all sorts of women that were involved that we don't know. So often they, uh, their husbands would have been the members and they would have been the ones doing the shopping and they would have been participating in that way. And you see a lot of that throughout the 19th century. And it's fact, in fact, when the uh, Women's Cooperative Guild forms in the early 1880s, that's mm-hmm. one of the very first things that they're looking at is they want to encourage women to be members in their own names uh, mm-hmm. and to go to meetings and to vote in their own names um, because a lot of cooperative societies at that point had said, well, we only want one member per household and cultural strictures would dictate that most of the time that would be the men. So uh, even though there is this commitment to women's equality, there's also a cultural baggage, um, you know, and the culture of the time suggests that there's, there are a lot fewer um, roles for women, but here's a way to bring them in and to, and they can always go back and say, well, the Rochdale pioneers and early cooperators said we can be members the same as men and you haven't changed those rules. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the the space was being made there. And then because it was also around, um, the movement was so based around consumer, uh, domestic consumption and women were the primary consumers, they also had Mm -hmm. a foot in the door. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and who are your favourite cooperative women, <laughs> Rachel? Uh, I have a list as long as my arm. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be good about a couple of the uh, book ones. One of them uh, has to be um, Margaret Llewellyn Davies, who was mm-hmm. not the first woman who started the Cooperative uh, Women's Guild, uh, but uh, was it one of its early leaders. She became its general secretary in 1889. Uh, at, in 1889, they had about... Uh, 50 branches of the guild already and about 1800 women in England and Wales later on Scotland started its own guild in the 1890s Um, Mm. but by the time uh, Margaret Lowland Davies retired in 1922 so many years later Mm. um, they had over 60 they they were oh gosh I have it written down somewhere but they had um, yeah, literally tens of thousands of members and there were guild branches up and down the country, a whole other guild in, in Scotland that had, it, had its own uh, th- thousands and thousands of members. Um, and mm-hmm. I think one of the things that she did, in addition to building up this organization, she also really connected between, for her, cooperatives were... Uh, the Women's Cooperative Guild was not just focused on women's role in co-ops, although that was a big part of it. And they, they did a lot of campaigning to get women on management committees, mm-hmm. women on educational committees, women to get into leadership positions throughout the movement, um, but also to be involved in their local cooperatives. Uh, but they also looked at the organization as also about being um, similar to the Women's Challenge, really looking at the ways that women's lives needed to be part of a public conversation. So they did a lot of campaigns. They, um, uh, they were involved in adult suffrage campaigns and women's suffrage mm-hmm. campaigns. They were involved in, um, they got 
in quite a pickle in the period around the First World War um, because they were proposing uh, changes to the divorce law. And there were huge campaigns to equalize mm -hmm. the um, divorce laws so that uh, basically in, in that period, if uh, grounds, there were very few grounds for divorce. And if you were a man, adultery was one of those grounds. If you were a woman, uh, adultery plus another one was the grounds, just to give you a <laughs> any so, Well, you know. Yeah, adultery. Um, so they were. They gave a lot of evidence from their members um, about what the harms for of the divorce law. And similarly, they did a lot of campaigning around maternal health. So mm -hmm. they did a ton of work. Um, they they published a book called Maternity in 1915, which you can find reprints of. It's amazing. It's both hopeful and depressing in equal <laughs> measure. Um, so it's letters from women talking about their experiences of of motherhood and child rearing um, of daily life. Each letter ends with a set of statistics, one of which is the number of births, miscarriages, and stillbirths, and the mm. weekly wage that they're surviving on. Um, yeah. So it's incredible, but they also talk about the role of the Women's Guild in helping them shape a better future for their children, um, for their daughters mm. in particular. And so there's, you know, so those kinds of things that were Margaret Lowell and Davies um, spearheaded make her one of my favorites. Um, there's another yeah. uh, particularly Northwest woman named Sarah Reddish, who I think tells you a lot of, too about what <laughs> it mean for people. Sarah Reddish uh, came from Bolton. Uh, she left school at 11 and started working in factories. Uh, she joined the Bolton Cooperative Society when she was in her, I think when she was about 30. Um, she remained mm -hmm. single. Um, over the years, she did all sorts of things. The Women's Guild hired its first organizer to try to get, first paid organizer to try to build membership in the Northwest, and she was their first paid organizer in the 1890s. Uh, she had all sorts of leadership positions. Um, sorry, I have to fun fumble for my notes here. Um, but she, she was just an amazing force of nature. Um, yeah, she was uh, she was still uh, she got herself elected under the poor law guardian so lo into local government at a time when most women women didn't have the national vote yet she stayed as a poor law guardian until she retired at 72 um, oh, wow. yeah uh, among her other many uh, many accomplishments she led in 1901 she led a petition drive in support of adult uh, and support of women's suffrage among women factory workers, um, which she had, had been one until, until she got to be a paid organizer. Um, and she led that deputation and was the one that handed it to, uh, handed the um, petition into parliament. She's just amazing. Uh, she organized mm. the Women's Trade Union League as well. She rode around and gave lectures on, her, on socialism on her bicycle, um, you know, in the turn of the 20th century. So just mm. a couple of, of wonderful people uh, who got mm. a huge range of things, yeah. but, but found their voice and their way through in the Women's Cooperative Guild. Brilliant. Well, we've just got a message from John, and I think his hand movements are indicating <laughs> that, you know, he agrees. <laughs> so, and uh, because of the, co the cooperative group um, project, I also have to give a shout out to Mary Cottrell, who, uh, gotten, who was, um, came out of Birmingham area and was the first woman to become a director of the CWC. <laughs> um, back it's when in it the right was, spots for John, Rachel. <laughs> we try, we try. Uh, but she was uh, the first woman in 1922. And at that time, the CWS was one of the largest businesses in Britain. Um, she traveled all over the world as a CWS director as well on behalf of the CWS. She went to India, she went to America, she went to Australia, uh, she went to Africa. Um, and, and she managed to stay active in cooperation well into the 1950s uh, and died mm. at 101 in 1969. So wow. quite an amazing woman wow. all in her own right and a huge cooperative, uh, cooperative group pioneer. Uh, I would also have to Brilliant. note, I'm sorry, John, that um, the next woman elected, so she was elected to CWS in, in 1922. The next woman elected wasn't elected until 1959. So, you know, there was some work to do yeah. in that part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. So, um, okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I might ask, um, no, I'll leave it till later actually for some, because I think we'll have plenty of time for some, for some questions later, but Great. Um, anything else, Rachel? Do you, do you want to, I mean, is there any, any other burning, um, you know, thing that you want to say around other cooperative women or 
Oh gosh. Um, I'm sure I'll okay. also. I think I'll pop in with something as we go along. How's that? <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, no, that's great. My, I would have, have one question is, could you talk a little bit about women in cooperatives that aren't retail societies? Because I know obviously the early co-op movement, particularly in the UK, was very much about retail. What, what about women in credit unions or housing co-ops or did, did your research cover any of that? My research was mostly focused on the consumer movement, but that does not yeah. at all mean that women were not involved in other kinds of cooperatives. And one of the things actually that the Women's Guild was very keen to do and campaigned on from very early on in the 1880s and 90s uh, was to try and connect the worker cooperatives, um, mm -hmm. consumer cooperatives, and make sure that the, that the consumer movement was supporting worker cooperatives, that those products were coming mm -hmm. in. There was a whole mm -hmm. lot of historical controversy over all of those things, but um, women were definitely involved in worker cooperatives, but because of the way, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century, there was so much gender segregation in work uh, that women and men were often not doing the same jobs or even often in the same industries. There was so much split. So uh, mm -hmm. I know that there were efforts. Um, I know there were needle workers cooperative, um, a variety mm. of different kinds of efforts, particularly in London, was a, London was a really strong area for worker cooperatives and women in that period, mm. and at Yorkshire mm. as well. Um, mm. But it's not the area that I know the most about. No, fine. thank you. That's really helpful. No, and and it's an area that's in dire need of more research as well. So uh, shout out to any historians who, who come yeah, across yeah. that and research more. Mm. Well, thanks, Rachel. And I, I guess it's going over to Becca, really, because I mean, I'd say just listening to Rachel, there's lots of crossovers in terms of, you know, women in um, in development, really, you know, in terms, especially in that household um, mm. and the role of women in, in, in that space as well. So, um, so we'll just talk to you now. Um, and I think you know, one of the questions is how have you engaged with with cooperatives and women in, in cooperatives throughout your career so maybe just talk a little bit about sure. that yeah absolutely you know, um, yeah no i agree there's lots of parallels there it feels like every generation is sort of dealing with the same questions in some ways um but yeah so my background i mean i I think in a way I was thinking about sort of where I started and I feel like there's been a real evolution and a resurgence of interest in sort of women's inclusion and cooperatives in during the time I've been working with co-op. So when I, when I first started, I've been, most of my engagement is, is through an organization called Twin. So Twin um, works with cooperatives in the global South through long-term partnerships and focuses on strengthening them as businesses and as organizations so that they can return the most value they can to their members. And so when I, f I have had two stints working with Twin and when I first started, actually gender wasn't really a kind of, it was, it was a kind of implicit part of what we were doing. Because I think Twin was really interested to try and make cooperatives as inclusive as possible. So we had a kind of, it wasn't a specific area of work, but we were always trying to encourage women to join and to put themselves forward for leadership roles. Um, but I remember... Yeah, it wasn't until I came back actually in 2012 that it became a kind of, it's now considered one of the six pillars of what we do. But I... I was thinking my kind of earliest experience, which was really powerful actually, which was that I was, vis I was, I started in more of a business capacity. I was developing kind of high quality single origin coffees with a cooperative in Peru. And I would visit every year. And I remember this one cooperative union, Cochla, they had a women's committee. And so every time I would go back, I'd go back once a year, I'd sort of see the evolution of this committee and kind of how things were changing in the organization. So they they started off as a separate organization. So they didn't feel they could create a space within the cooperative union itself. They, they were kind of meeting on their own in the evening. And there was quite a lot of resistance. I remember talking to quite a few women about how their husbands didn't want them to come and how it was a bit of a kind of big deal that they wanted to come and meet on their own. And then they, they managed to have a, managed to contract a gender advisor who worked with this group and gradually the group became incorporated into the organization and started to have a budget mm. to do training and I think the thing that really struck me about it was obviously you know we think about the kind of economic empowerment aspect of women becoming involved in a cooperative but I think what really struck me at the time was just how deep the experience was for some of those women um, because they had this opportunity to do training um, mm on really quite sort of profound issues to do with self-esteem and identity and representation. And I just dropped in, I used to sort of, it wasn't part of my official remit, but I'd always try and kind of go to one of their meetings because it was so fascinating. And mm. I remember dropping in and I just asked the group of women, you know, what impact has this program had for you? And I remember this woman standing up and saying, 
I didn't have a sense of myself as an individual before. I didn't know, I sort of saw my role as somewhere between the kind of, they literally, literally said, I mean, she was speaking in Quechua, but she said somewhere between the animals and my husband in terms of the hierarchy of the household. Mm. And she said, I now have a sense of myself as a person and as somebody who has rights and, you know, who is an individual. And it just really kind of struck, yeah. you know, chord with me. I thought, my goodness. So I, I really sort of have a, a sense since then of how cooperatives, yeah, they, it's, it's quite a multifaceted um, kind of opportunity that I feel like it offers women because I, mm. I, there's, yeah, obviously the chance to develop leadership skills, the start, you know, the chance to join, you know, as Rachel was saying, as members in your own right and, um, you know, be kind of stand up and be counted and have a vote and deliver your products and therefore have more control of your income. But also, I think particularly in Latin America, there's, yeah, it's been this space for really, um, yeah, really working on women's self-esteem and identity. And then the, also the other dimension I think I've seen as well is, um, and particularly the work that Twin's been doing in recent years, has been using the cooperative structure as a way to then work more closely with households and work on gender mm. dynamics um, using a household methodology. So um, I guess, yeah, if I sort of fast forward to when I came back to Twin as an mm. associate and I've, my, my role has always been focused on gender um, in the last sort of six or seven years, we, the first piece of work we did, um, so yeah, we'd sort of defined, it, it had taken quite a lot of campaigning, almost in parallel to that corporate in Peru, actually, that I could mm -hmm. see that there was a real campaign going on to kind of convince people that gender was a really important area of focus. And um, similarly in Twin, actually, there was a woman who, yeah, really had to kind of push for it to be something that we were working on, I think, because you know, as always in cooperatives on, you know, twin, there's a kind of business focus, a practical focus. There's so many challenges anyway to kind of get products to market, get the quality right, you know, get producers paid on time, build reserves, all of these kind of imperatives that drive things forward. And I think sort of to try and create a space and to really get people to see that gender is absolutely sort of should be central to all of that, you know, rather than just this kind of side issue. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, she succeeded finally in kind of getting gender on the agenda. And then I came back in time, we did a piece of research, um, which we published called Empowering Women in Agricultural Value Chains, um, which was basically, we just wanted to get a snapshot of the situation of women in some of the countries that we were working in and in the three commodity chains we were working on, which were coffee, cocoa, and nuts, and also try and capture good practice. Cause we were aware that some of the co-ops we were working with had been working on this issue for quite a long time. And we wanted mm. to really capture the interesting lessons and things that we thought could be shared. And from that, um, we basically realized that we needed to be working at different levels. So I think historically, as I say, our focus had always been, you know, how do we encourage more women to join and how do we get them to put themselves forward for leadership roles? We'd also been marketing some coffee specifically from women farmers as a kind of right. But we realized that we needed to work. We defined four levels, basically. So we now work at the household, the cooperative, the market, mm -hmm. and then also on advocacy. Um, oh, my Zoom is, I'm not sure if you can still hear me. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Mine's kind of going in and out. Um, so, yeah. So, so I think, yeah, one of the most interesting things for me recently has been um, a couple of areas, really. One has been, yeah, working with this household methodology called gender action learning, which is the mm. methodology that we first learned about from one of the co-ops that we were working with. So we, this is an extraordinary co-op called the Bukonzo Joint Cooperative Union, mm. which is in Western Uganda. And they are a group made up quite a lot actually of refugees from the Congo who came kind of came over the border and settled there. So they were working in really sort of tough circumstances economically. And they were, they were a majority women cooperative, um, started off as a savings and credit union and then became involved in the coffee market. But they basically in the, in the early days when they were trying to save, um, they realized that women were able to save very little money. They were working all year round on the coffee fields, but they had very little kind of disposable income. So they did some analysis and realized that basically men, the kind of pattern there was that men, men owned the land and they would be absent most of the time working in the city. Women would be farming the coffee and then at harvest time, the men would come back and say, thanks very mm. much. You know, the coffee would be delivered, the cash would go in his pocket and they would disappear back to the city. Mm. So they kind of had this very stark situation, you know, very large families. Women were sort of had sort of on average 12 children each you know, getting by with sort of subsistence farming and a little bit of additional business. So they, they developed some tools um, to, to, to kind of start to create change in these areas around asset ownership, around decision making, around mm -hmm. 
um, the distribution of labor, actually involving women, men in coffee positively again, encouraging them to join the organization. So for them, it's been a quite a different dynamic of actually trying to get men to join rather than get women to join. And they've had mm. really amazing results. So we were, we were working with them, kind of helping them market their coffee. And, we, and all of the, the method is visual. So everything in that organization is represented visually and they do visual plans and visions. It's, it's, the whole method is really about kind of getting the household to work together as a unit mm. and plan and develop household plans. And, and then as part of, with that focus, they then start to analyze kind of the gender dynamics and see what they want to change. So I think having seen it work so well there, we've now, we tried it as a pilot in a couple of other organizations, one in, in Eastern DRC, which was kind of recovering from conflict and again, had really mm. challenging circumstances. And then we've, we're just coming to the end of a five-year project where we've managed to kind of do that training in, in seven different, yeah, seven different organizations in East and Southern Africa. Um, and then sort of alongside that working on, yeah, how to, uh, you know, we're still marketing women's coffee as a, as a tool to encourage more women to join in their own rights and encourage resource distribution in the household. So encourage men to share land with their wives so that they can join mm. and then they can sell the coffee. And then we've also been working on, um, yeah, encouraging women to, to put themselves forward for leadership and trying to really understand the barriers to why that might not be happening. Um, and, and then, yeah, also advocacy. So kind of bringing different actors together in the different value chains to share it and document approaches, which we've been doing in conjunction with some other partners and publishing learning as much as possible, sort of trying to just keep on generating, mm. um, yeah, information about what's working and what the challenges are and sort of encourage sharing across the different commodity mm. chains. Um, so, yeah. And how, I guess, I mean, I was just flicking through your report earlier, you know, it's um, one of the things that... Um, I saw was that you know in terms of getting men involved in that in in include including women you know they need they needed the rationale that actually this makes makes economic sense you know so is that yeah. is that true yeah. is that you know that oh well you know it's leadership's okay but actually the the business just, case of gender equality. yeah and it just seems totally really, yeah we were talking yeah. about the business case and and we had a, a conversation in this workshop we had where with that publication came out of and yeah we were normally we think about this in business case of kind of convincing the big companies and actually we had a real sort of clear moment of going no 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 it has to start with the household there has to be a really clear business case in the household for both men and women i think for women yeah. you know for women to really focus on this cash crop or to become more involved um and actually mizuzu in malawi the cooperative have a, a really nice way of putting it they said they want to move women from a subsistence to a commercial role in agriculture mm. and it's not that they weren't involved before it's just that their their involvement was not recognized and there was no real sort of monetary value placed on their involvement so you're right in order to kind of kind of encourage men i mean i think that's why women's coffee that's a fairly kind of clear mm. incentive because there's an additional premium and that kind of thing but actually in conversation with farmers in Mizuzu, I did, they really had to concede that basically the pattern generally is that men, yeah, when men control the income, less of it gets spent in the household. It kind of goes into their pocket and there's more spending outside as a sort of diplomatic way of putting it in various ways. Um, and so when women, you know, I think they saw within a couple of seasons of women bringing, you know, selling their own coffee, where suddenly their house had a new roof. Suddenly like the kids were sort of, better feds you know things just they could see tangible things starting to improve and they had to really admit that actually having women involved in that sort of joint decision making and having more of a say about how that resource was spent was was giving really you know tangible benefits and that other people were starting to ask them you know what's happened and are you earning more money and you know they started to kind of notice um but I think, yeah, it's a tricky one. I think that's where also household methodologies are really useful because they build this sense of unity and sort of shared enterprise. Because I think mm -hmm. in some contexts where we've been working with women's coffee, I think if there is, if you're just doing that and you're not working on the kind of deeper process of change, there can be quite a kind of hard nosed attitude from men of like, oh, well, that's fine because there's an extra premium. But if there ever wasn't an extra premium, maybe I'd just take the land back and, you know, I'll manage it. You know, so I think it's the, the two of them together is what we're finding is effective because, I think through this household planning and visioning, I think that really builds a kind of, um, yeah, kind of unity and a sense of, um, yeah, cooperation actually within the household. And that sort of makes it, there's a much stronger underpinning. Um, yeah, it kind of. I mean, I think that's in terms of that tiered approach, I mean, 
Because um, I know we had um, Sarah Vakari who did a PhD. I've not talked about this before, but she she had she did her PhD on um, women in co-ops in um, I think it was in Brazil. It was Brazil. Yeah, and um, what she was about was the disconnect. It was Brazil. Yeah, um, and it was a disconnect between women's empowerment within the, within the co-op, and then when they got home, so this cultural, this really different cultural disconnect between mm -hmm. between that and what so. How you know so co-ops are you know you could say the liberated models you know because 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 that's that's happening but what then happens mm. when you know um, you go outside of yeah. the co-op and the cultural norms are very different so I mean have you so when you say that about you know that deeper work what what for you is that deeper work um, your agenda I think it's just creating um, well the method that we use I guess creates a space for conversations to happen and it and it does it in a way that's quite light-hearted and quite fun so that's kind of the it's actually mm -hmm. one of the principles of it is it's got to be fun because it's sort of meant to be something that people want to do but um yeah I think it's about having the space really so so I think it's about creating sort of engaging processes that the family can do together members of the family that, that kind of lead them into discussion around some of these issues and then it's also at the community level so we, we normally do the training for a group of say 20 farmers and we normally do it for women and men together um, and so some of the exercises they do separately and then they compare results and even that can generate you know quite a lot of sort of good humor and laughter and then yeah and they, part of the method is it involves I mean this has all been created through you know close collaboration with this cooperative in western Uganda so they use song they use role play theater and the, the method uses drawing so there's a kind of there's something about it where they yeah it's meant to be engaging but I think um I think out of that and I is is that you can then what you need is in a sense is a group of men who who become convinced who become champions for the method and a group of women but I think it's I think often when when you sort of you know you develop strategies um one thing that we do recognize with this method is not is husbands and wives aren't necessarily easy allies and it's not always easy to have these conversations at a household level so part of the method is also about um, strengthening your social networks and finding co collaborators and allies which might be your neighbor your friend or and sometimes in some contexts it's actually better for men to work with influencing men and women to work with influencing women in other contexts it works quite well to even do the couples training you know do train them together it depends a little bit on the context really but I think um, that's part of it and and because I think you can have you know you can have strong female role models but as you say there can still be this disconnect you know men can feel really comfortable with these kind of high level figures you know on the board of the union or something but mm -hmm. they still don't quite like the idea of their wife going to a meeting you know it's a sort of so it's um and I think yeah I mean it it takes time I guess but I I, I think the idea is um I think the methodology takes it it's, it's a kind of sensitization methodology but it tries to take it that it's trying to also internalize it I think in a different way and put it in encourage people to put it into practice and it's a peer learning methodology so basically each person that learns it and and likes it is then encouraged to, for them to then train others so that's the way that the idea is to try and create a bit of a critical mass because otherwise as you say you get a group of people who are trying to do things differently and then the work you know the sort of and also the, yeah part of the mapping exercise they do is about yeah thinking about others so other sorts of duty bearers or traditional leaders or others in the community that they can engage with so they often reach out through their networks of say church schools you know just of their own volition really it's all kind of voluntary um they they kind of people who like the method sort of tend to want to kind of run with it and tell others about it so in that sense it it spreads but i mean there's still there's still a way to go um it's a slow i think that level it is a slow process um but I think, yeah, but I, you know, we've done this five-year project, which was a bit of a luxury, actually. We don't always have that long. And, um, and you know, we could definitely see changes. And, um, yeah, I think, and, and I think it's one of those iterative processes where at the beginning, the sorts of changes they're, they're envisioning maybe are not that ambitious. They're kind of the low-hanging fruit. And then they see that, like, oh, okay, that's changed. Maybe I could think a bit bigger, you know, and you sort of see people getting more ambitious as time goes on. Um, I remember vividly in yeah working in central Malawi like one of the first meetings that a man put his hand up and said I want to learn to cook and everyone else kind of laughing you know and then kind of going back a few years later there was quite a few of them that were like very comfortable with saying yeah yeah I know how to cook now and you know so you sort of yeah you can see things changing over time um yeah can 
if I can jump in just briefly, yeah, yeah. I'm, um, those parallels are coming in just uh, in, in listening to you talk. Um, one of the, when you're talking about the Women's Committee and the separate organization needs in Brazil, uh, that was very much how the Women's Guild operated as well. They were encouraging women to be more involved in their cooperatives, but they were very protective of having a, a, a single sex organization. And they were so much focused on confidence building I mean, so much of their early activities were um, we want to bring you in, we'll read papers to each other, you can start writing a paper, we'll do, uh, they, their training was, we'll show you how to reach, re read a ba balance sheet, we'll get you comfortable mm -hmm. speaking in public and so much of it was about confidence building and there's a quote I'll never forget from one of the women looking back on her experiences um, said, you know, from a shy and nervous woman, the guild made me a fighter. And that was very much a, a feeling that, that they all had. But, and mm -hmm. then when you were talking about making the business case and at the kind of at the household level, one of the things that uh, was a huge um, symbol for the Women's Guild, that they, they talked about the woman with the basket, meaning your market basket, their membership card literally had a, you know, a strong woman looking out over the factories with her market basket on, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on her arm. Um, but what they were really saying was, hey, these women with these market baskets have a lot of power as consumers and they're skilled. This, there is skill in what they're doing and, and we need to encourage these women and the men around them to see this as a skilled activity that they're involved in and that their expertise as the ones that are buying these products and using these products are, uh, mm -hmm. it should be valuable to the movement too and trying to make some of that business case about why we need more women involved in the leadership. But it was, it, so much of education and training was partly about empowerment and confidence for women to be able to take those steps in their own lives and then also to value those skills for the movement. So mm -hmm. I think it's just and it's it's also, it's also, it's a continuing it's challenge and approach. Mm. Really interesting. Yeah, I think one of the most powerful bits of training a colleague of mine developed was in DRC was she had a meeting with some women and just asked them to tell their life story because first of all they did a session on what leadership is and what leadership skills are and then she just asked and they had a kind of story circle and then she helped them to see how they were already demonstrating leadership skills because so many of them had been through so many difficult experiences oh, yeah. and that's a court where they had no women on the board and now they've got three I think and I felt like it was one of those real one of those trainings I was like ah oh, we've struck something here because it was yeah. so much of it's that sort of intangible sense of like oh no I don't think I could join or what have I got to offer you know and exactly. to see that actually they had a huge amount to offer. Um, yeah, it sounds, it sounds like I should go and look at the work of the Women's Guild, <laughs> take some <laughs> ideas. But, um, well, it sounds like they, what they can give you, it, you know, one thing they can give you is that, you know, they had a lot of success with this model. They built from, mm. from very small beginnings, you know, um, Margaret Ellen Davies, who was, um, you know, a f um, fairly upper middle class woman who somehow got involved in, in this organization. Um, but you know, so she, her experiences of working with working class women, she was sort of, a, you know, she talks about being just amazed at how little they left their homes. Like the only yeah. time they left their mm -hmm. homes was really to go to the shops and often, uh, and there was so much work involved in, in, in running a home. I mean, descriptions of laundry day will turn your hair white. Um, yeah, um, So, but they were able to move from, from this very, women having very isolated experiences and build this whole organization. They were doing train the trainers, peer-to-peer -peer training um, was a huge part of what they did. And they sort of built that structure up from below in a lot of ways. And it sounds like, mm. um, you know, just, they're just, just an interesting example yeah, to, yeah. to, to so give. The, the Women's Guild obviously disbanded a few years ago. Um, they did some marvellous work over the previous century, but I wonder if there's any international parallels or any other international examples of women actually getting together across co-ops rather than just within a, within a region or within a, uh, within a particular co-op, but actually across the country or across other, mm. other areas. Do you know there was, you and I haven't done a lot of research on it, but there, um, but there was an international women's cooperative guild uh, that was formed in 1921 and worked to try to bring women movement uh, together and they actually had international women's guild congresses every few years mm -hmm. um it was part of the sort of internationalist focus of the of the 20s and 30s in a lot of um, degrees but there is at least that model there mm -hmm. um i think as the guild uh, grew older and particularly in the post second world war period a there was a lot of competition for work women's organizations you know they'd in some ways done their work so well um and 
that mm -hmm. uh, there, there were many more opportunities. And so it became harder uh, for, I think, it to hold together as an organization. Um, mm -hmm. They also uh, were, they were staunchly pacifist in the Second World War, um, which made them somewhat less popular as the Second World War went on. Um, yeah. uh, so, so that's an aspect of, of the guild having some membership, uh, uh, you know, longstanding membership decline as the co-op movement did in, in the second half of the 20th mm -hmm. century. So I think they became a, a bit more inward looking um, and, and began to have a harder time attracting new people in. And there was, and so you kind of wait until the, the next wave of feminism to start to re-energize to some degree. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm sure there are more international examples than, than just the 1920s era international guild, but that's what came to mind. Well, John's just an example of the, was it the Grameen, Grameen, Bank. Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. Mm. 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 I'm sure. Hmm. There's one in Nicaragua as well. The, well, it's a coffee one, but it's national, called Las Flores de Café, mm. which is um, which is interesting because it mixes women employees and women members of co-ops, so quite mm -hmm. different sort of educational levels as well. Um, yeah. Hmm. So I've just muted everyone now. So here are John and Chloe. Um, it's Chloe. I was introducing Chloe actually. Chloe um, started at the college yesterday. So this is absolute dedication, absolute dedication. So she sat in the other room. Um, but yeah, John and Hira and Chloe, um, just chip into this discussion now because you know, it's gone in a couple of minutes. So um, John, do you, do you want to, any reflections for you? I mean, I love what Rachel said um, because I, I I do have pen histories of most of the women in the early days. Um, what I would want from this this type of discussion and and all others is how we uh, drive it forward. I'm currently well, I'm trying, pretty much put together a list of the gender uh, parity on the main retail boards, and I've just recently produced that. Um, I have to be honest and say that it is for other reasons to do with my job as well. Um, but um, you may want to know that uh, currently on the main retail societies, uh, there are 56 women on the boards and 75 men. Mm. That's a remarkable to, In the time that I've been working with just for the party, let alone uh, the, the societies, uh, that is, is almost trampled. Mm. We still have some recalcitrant uh, areas, uh, Heart of England board, which actually has the chair mm -hmm. of Cops UK on it, have recently um, taken on a new director who is a man, and that's taken up to 11 directors, all of whom were men. Um, so even within, the, you know, even within the retail movement, we've still got a little bit to go. Uh, actually, I'll share those figures with you, uh, Becky, for, 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 the, for the news, if it helps. Thank you, John. Um, and Scott Nid is also... Did you do any research on the effectives as well, John? Did you look Sorry. at the uh, figures? Did you look at figures? Oh, well, yes, I've got, yeah. yeah no, the executives have, have had a massive change only this year because of mm. what's happened with Central England. So execs only, uh, there are now 80 women and 85 men, mm. which is quite mm. remarkable. That, that's been a change in really only a matter of about three or four years. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying how old I am, but when I first started, um, you know, I used to go to director dinners and the wives used to get a present uh, because it was totally expected that only the, di only the men would be directors and they would, of course, bring their wives with them. Um, and, and, that, and that's 30 years ago. Uh, oh God, it might be longer. Um, but I mean, the point is, is that whilst things have changed and they've definitely changed for the better, it, we're, we're still, I think, still way behind. The cognitive movement can say that it leads the way, but I haven't really looked closely at, as, as others have said, I haven't looked closely at other cooperatives, the, the, the worker cognitive movement and the, uh, and, and the wider cognitive movement. I know that the very large cops in the UK Things like the dairy co-ops uh, and some of the uh, the small industrial co-ops, they're still predominantly men. Um, when I go to events and activities with worker co-ops, still leans heavily towards men. Um, 
But again, that can be skewed because worker co-ops don't always go to a lot of events because they're too busy working uh, mm -hmm. on most retailers that uh, have loads of opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. So I, th I think we I think we should use both the old examples of of, of the Cooperative Guild and dig for more stories. You know, it, it isn't just um, the, the woman I absolutely adore, uh, Sarah Reddish, uh, but there's other other women that mm. did the most amazing things. But they're isolated. You know, I could read off thousands of blogs with a fantastic history of trying to support and help and change the world. We have too few examples of women in those early days in the UK. Um, mm. But we do seem to have more examples now around the world. And that I'm also equally as much in love with the Quiet Cuckoo, not just because they produce cocoa for chocolate, but they introduced women to their boards almost from the start. Mm. And those women have gone on to do some remarkable things, including owning a listed company on the stock exchange in this country, which is going to be said to be pretty good. Um, and I think we, we, we get examples from them. There's the, I never know how to pronounce it, but the Rahaba women, the ones in uh, Kurdistan. Kurdistan. So we, 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 we use those because when we have those as examples, and then we have the examples of Debbie uh, taking over the CEO at Central England. We have a number of uh, uh, chairs of the boards of several societies now. I think we can use those. Because when you start with one, I mean, it used to just be Bill or Pauline Green at one time. You know, she <laughs> the only woman in the whole movement in the UK, I stress. Mm -hmm. um, look, it's, it, it has moved on, but it's still miles behind. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there is yeah. a lot of difficult yeah. walks. <laughs> John, in your statistics, did you look at black, Asian or minority ethnic women? I'm afraid I haven't yet. I've only been able to do that by, by personal knowledge. Um, people have to self-declare. Uh, I'm involved with the. I'm sorry, I'm very white. I'm involved with the Bain Network within the party, and uh, and uh, also on the core group. Um, uh, but of course, people have to self-declare. Uh, some some people, it's obvious. However, there's a lot of people who who would declare themselves as Bain, uh, mm -hmm. but be obvious to other people uh, as to what their ethnicity is and. and mm -hmm. Background is, mm -hmm. so it's, it's difficult. People at the moment don't. We don't even ask that in the core party at, at the mm -hmm. moment. But, uh, someone's. Um, we don't even ask them what their gender is. We just make assumptions based on whether they see themselves as Miss or Mrs. or whatever. Um, that's that's work to be done. But I think the lead could be women. I think. I think. Um, Oh, sort of, sort of. Oh, no, no, it's just, I think, I, I, yeah, I, it, it's great, John. Um, I think for me as well, I just want to go back to what Becky and some of the themes that Rachel was talking about, just right, because I always find that when, when women come together, you know, in terms of around that creativity, um, they, a lot of things can happen. And I think one of when I first started at college and I was traveling out with Linda to Malawi, you know, one, I think it's a story I always tell really was when we went to visit a cooperative and um, they were insistent, these, these three women were insistent that they would put a drama, they would put a play on for us. You know, and we're going, oh, why? So John was translating him, why do they want to do this? And they said, well, they want to, so anyway, they did the play, it was translated. And basically the story was that these three women wanted to set up their own cooperative. Um, and the play was about, you know, how the men in the cooperative and outside the cooperative thought they were prostitutes because they wanted to set up a cooperative. So they can't possibly be business women; they have to be prostitutes, you know. And it was just really, and they, but they did that through play and through drama, and it was a really, it was really powerful. You know, it was one of my first visits through the college, really. But they use that creativity to tell a really tricky story, a really hard story of how, how women are perceived if they are then, you know, um, taking taking stand, you know, taking power, taking control. That's the challenge we have. And, you know, I'm sure there's lots of parallels in the UK as well, but I just, it was that theme of creativity as well that mm -hmm. I think women, not that men don't, but women tend to draw, get drawn to that in some way as well. Well, and I think some of what, um, uh, so Linda Shaw, uh, wonderful Cooperative College alumni, um, some of the research she did in the mainstreaming cooperative um, mainstream cooperatives book that we did looked at the way that we try to looked at did an international focus to look at, at gender equity across the movement and some of the challenges was literally just getting the data 
um, having gender disaggregated data, let alone um, you know d diversity. Um, ethnic diversity um, data is also obviously has data problems, so that's part of it. But one of the other things she was talking about, and there's a lot in there about different practices and best practices um, and some training ideas, but um, I think what will be very interesting to look forward into the future is we are starting to get to points where we have more than one or two women in cooperative boards or in cooperative management leadership positions. And I think that that's going to be a really interesting and telling thing where we start to get to tell some new stories here about what happens when women are a critical mass um, and, and are able to actually be in an equal position and, and, um, and, and how does that influence how businesses uh, and cooperative models work. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got one more left, actually, um, I'm, I'm being a strict timekeeper because I'm just respecting your time really, but any final reflections and um, before, thank you to Rachel and Becca, but any, Hira, any comments yes. or any? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm listening to four of you and this is really uh, give me insight at what problem, I'm, I'm, no, I'm a chairperson for the um, a woman cooperative committee in my provincial level and uh, it's really hard to draw women to, uh, I mean more women in, in, in our movement you know this woman is like if they have a baby and then just stop until their like motherhood and then our culture is like uh, when I was in in, uh, in motherhood uh, I met uh, Pauline Green with uh, my baby in a um, and uh, uh, what's my slings? Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I'm still working with my baby, and sometimes it's still a breastfeeding. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful because my husband is really supporting me for mm -hmm. all the activities mm -hmm. um, because I, I've been doing it and since I was 50, 17. So mm -hmm. uh, I was in, in, in one uh, co-op, this woman co-op, and then here, uh, unfortunately, the male and female or men co-op, who's the, uh, really by men, is most failed than a woman. So successful mm -hmm. co-op, yeah, so successful co-op, it's mostly woman co-op. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we... Just for the daily daily uh, activities, like um, avoiding them from the money lender, mm -hmm. you know, and the the one like you talk about the um, coffee farmer uh, mm -hmm. in Africa, yeah, we have we have our here uh, as well, but mm -hmm. you know it's it's really small group of the farmers want to get because you know we can't have the land, you know, mm -hmm. this is always men take. Uh, care of the properties. Um, that's a wonder when the, the difficulties, the obstacle we have uh, facing here. So here, do you want to say where you're from? Mm, I'm from Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm from Bandung, Indonesia, the city, um, one of five biggest city in Indonesia. Mm. Uh, yeah, but I'm I'm working across the Indonesia. It's just like um. Twice in twice in a year, I, I went to I, I go to the small island in Sumatra, and I found the woman to, to the uh, the wife of the fisherman. They mm. do things like um how to make um uh what is it the fish, and then um they sell the fish, and I have to try to uh find them um the trainer. How can to make a fish uh, life longer than just sell mm -hmm. only fish? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. So uh, today I'm tonight. I'm really happy to see you all, <laughs> and especially yeah, I'm Sarah. Delighted to see you again. Actually, it was great to see you in Manchester. I'm absolutely delighted you've hooked, hooked yeah, into. This is so late. This is you. Yeah. yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much for, for, for all the insight. I'm really happy. Yeah. As well. It's lovely to have a man on board too. Yeah. I think it's really important because it, it's not just a women's issue, women in cooperatives. It, it's a male issue too. Exactly. And I think the men have to be a huge part of that conversation. 
Um, interestingly, I know that Central England have been one of a, a big, big champion of uh, women in cooperatives, and I know they're they're actually thinking about having a men in cooperatives as well. To actually talk about some of these similar issues, but in a, in a male environment, which is quite interesting.